in Arih, in Bethlehem, in Jerusalem, continue, although their news, their struggle, is on the last pages of the media. <laughs> Only yesterday, reconciliation is beginning to adopt institutional expressions in Lebanon. The new situation in Lebanon promises, after so many years of tragedy, to have a new light at the end of the tunnel. The Lebanese no longer torn between themselves as they were for the last 15 years are beginning the healing process. The Palestinian uprising is beginning to provide the Palestinian state the embryo of a functioning society and an operation institution. These are great achievements. But it seems that the media in many instances do not want to probe into these deeper elements of Arab contribution that they see in us. Only the element of dependency, seeking to attract, as I call it, the dumping ground of the overflow of their arguments into our midst so that they can manage them, they can use them, and we self-inflict the loss of our independence and sovereignty. So we see a paradox in the Arab political map. Countries that have been independent, almost losing their independence, while countries like Palestine and Lebanon, who almost lost their independence, beginning to assert the independence of their will. That. Back, back to the Gulf crisis. We in the Arab world have had historically an underlying urge for Arab unity. We have always known in our younger days that the boundaries and borders are artificially made, that the colonial countries divided us in order to accommodate their own interests. But on the other hand, unity has to be an act of volunteering ourselves to abandon the technicalities of something. So we rejoiced in the 1958 when Syria and Egypt united under the president of Nasser at that time, we rejoiced when the two Yemens united together after they had been divided for so many years. Unity is the anchor of the Arab soul, but unity as a matter and a consequence of coercion, of forced annexation, is not the unity that we seek, the unity that we seek is the unity of popular participation discovering their national destiny. <laughs> that is why we have sought throughout this period of crisis, on the one hand, eager to have Iraq withdraw from Kuwait in order that we reascertain the legitimacy of the Arab system, the Arab state system. But the Arab state system is legitimate, but it is equally vulnerable. Because the Arab state system has developed a legitimacy of its own, so many years have passed where well, these independent and sovereign states have assumed roots because we had all sorts of colonial powers, French and British, Turkish, Lib uh, Italian and others. 
So when we developed into independence, Arab countries became independent at different times against different kinds of colonialism. So we had the paradoxical situation of one Arab nation with 21 Arab individual states. These states threw in within the framework of the Arab League assumed a legitimacy. But this legitimacy was also to reconcile itself with a historical legitimacy that we are one Arab nation, one Arab culture, one Arab civilization, and that is why our sovereignty was not sacrosanct, although the sovereignty of states was legitimate. And this posed a problem, a difficult dilemma, where we have to reconcile between the imperatives of sovereignty and the imperatives of Arab unity. And in the search for a sense of direction, in order that we do not frustrate legitimacy, and in order not to frustrate the urge for unity, we needed to resort back to wisdom. Wisdom, irrational discourse, intellectual clarity, and a resilient culture. And that eluded us for the last 15 years. As a result, we had the crisis of Lebanon, a microcosm of what is taking place today. The Arab system legitimate, but not sacrosanct. Legitimate, but vulnerable. It was vulnerable because this Arab order, this Arab system, was unable to deliver the independence of Palestinian state even after the PLO reconciled itself grudgingly to the existence of an Israeli state. The Arab system was unable to witness and bring about the unity of Lebanon after 15 years of tragic experience. The Arab system was vulnerable because it was unable to deliver Arab wealth to the entirety of the Arab people. We are a rich nation because of our oil, but we are a rich nation of poor people, and that is a situation we have to come to grips with. <laughs> and as long as this problem remains, this dilemma confronts us. History will be made for us and not by us. That is why we feel that we have been excluded from the benefits of the detente. As a matter of fact, many of us in the Arab world feel that we are potentially the victims of a false detente. Hence, we have to be careful. We have to immunize ourselves. We have to rediscover the potentialities of our legitimate strength. That is why this interruption that we are witnessing today, we are coming to a situation whereby we have to decide that the Iraqi regime has inflicted on the Arab body politic a very, very strong wound, a deep wound. Now, the question arises, do we want this wound to be healed or do we want to amputate Iraq? We want to heal the wound. We do not want to amputate any part of the Arab body politics. We want to correct. We do not want to revenge. We want to heal. We don't want to amputate. It's a very difficult situation. We cannot give a clarity of a sense of direction. 
But we must be deferential, we must be respectful. For those people whose long accumulated historical frustrations have led them to demonstrate throughout the West Bank and Gaza and in Jordan and in Algeria. They call some of this rebellion of the spirit, quote, Islamic fundamentals. Let everybody know that there is a fundamental difference between Islamic fundamentalism and obscurantism. We welcome the roots of our civilization and we deny obscurantism to obscure us from the future of our world. By the same token, the same thing about Lebanon. Those people who feel that Lebanon is alienated from the whole entirety of Arab culture, of Islamic civilization, must realize that it were the Christian Arabs of the 19th century, Shibli Shmail, Jirji Zaydan, Yazji, Amin al-Rihani, Jibran Khalil Jibran, who brought to the forefront the renaissance of Arab culture and who rediscovered the Islamic value and the humanist values of Arab civilization. And therefore, <laughs> that there not be those who seek that is where the Israeli Zionist objective is. Plans to witness our Arab funeral. Let us tell them that the Arabs are going to bury each other. We want our wedding to come through in the 90s while Israel is planning our funeral. Let them know that the Palestinian uprising is beginning to formulate the Arab uprising. That is the task of the Arab people in the 90s. That is the task of your unity in the United States to show that Arab Americans are united, that the divisions that are occurring in the Arab world must not be mirrored into your community. Your community must re-inspire the Arabs to rediscover their national unity and their national destiny. Thank you very much. message and I hope we will live up to it. Islamic fundamentalism is part of us and Christianity is part of us. We are all one together. Ladies and gentlemen, before I can go any further, I would also like to recognize some of our good friends that are present here tonight and I'm sorry I forgot to introduce them initially. We have uh, some uh, Arab friends that uh, came all the way from Houston to be with us tonight. Please recognize them. The Houston table. <laughs> also, my dear brother and sister, Samar and Khalil Sakakini, and the ABC Austin chapter is all here, ladies and gentlemen. Give them a warm welcome. very hard-working people, I know that we've been together. Ladies and gentlemen, some of our guests could not make it tonight, but they did send us letters and I would like to read some of them. I don't know if many of you know that the uh, Mexican uh, Consul General in San Antonio is an Arab, or is a Mexican of an Arab origin. Mr. Humberto Haddad. He sent us a letter and I would like to read it to you. I want to thank your kind invitation 
to join the annual banquet for the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee. The importance of events in the Middle East is a world priority and certainly one, of one which requires goodwill as well as a deep commitment for the restoration of regional peace. I wish you a successful encounter producing lasting lives to, to recover the lost roads for international harmony in the Middle East. Knowing the, now, knowing the power of your ideas, there is no doubt you can do it. With my best wishes for the good health of all of you, I remain sincerely yours, Humberto Hernandez Haddad. Congressman Gonzalez has also sent us a letter, and he even log-handed it, ladies and gentlemen. He wrote it. Congressman Gonzalez and myself go way back. I've been talking to him for the last eight years. I've been discussing the Middle East with him, and he became the voice of reason in the U.S. Congress. He sent us a letter, and it's too long because it, I think it's personal, but uh, he relays the message that he was, he's very thankful for the invitation and he wishes us a successful banquet. Miss, uh, Mrs. Helen Duckmer, city council person of San Antonio, also sent us a letter, and I like this one. Mm -hmm. She says, my fond memories of last year's banquet are still vivid. The courtesies and hospitality extended to me are deeply appreciated. City Hall has always appreciated the great efforts which the American Arab Anti-Discrimination Committee has contributed to the San Antonio community. The local Arab community continues to play an integral part in the cultural educational and economic development of our city. Again, thank you for your kind invitation. It is with a great regret that I decline. I look forward to hearing from you in the very near future. My best regards and best wishes for a successful banquet. Helen Duckner. <clears throat> now, Mrs. Hebri, have you been selling those tickets? Wow. <laughs> We're gonna have a drawing about 10.30. I wanna hurry this up because I know y'all are excited waiting for the band to come and play. But unfortunately, our national office has relied on me to do this. <clears throat> Usually, <clears throat> our national office, every ADC banquet is usually attended by either the president or the chairman of ADC. And this year, they have apparently such a trust in us that they left it up to us to do this and handle it on our own. One very important thing that we usually do during these banquets is to try and raise money for our national office. As you all know, we have a staff in Washington, D.C that's busy doing a lot of work on our behalf. And these people need support. We don't take money from any governments or any Arab countries or otherwise. And gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, if you want this work to continue, please reach in the center of your table. There is some envelopes and if you don't mind, give us a contribution, and we would like for you to be generous. Some of our people would be walking around and trying to gather those envelopes. Now, I would like for Dr. Maksud, while we have him here, to please come and present two very, very important awards that the San Antonio chapter of ADC would like to give to some very, very important members of our community. Let me go get those flags first. <laughs> Can I have the flags? 
ladies and gentlemen, this award is very, very important to me. It is very close to my heart. This award that will be going to Dr. Najah Hashelji is very important and I would like to tell you why. During the life of a human being, we are born, we go to school, we fight, we learn, and then we become a professional. And a lot of us go about their own lives, dedicated to their own families, and so forth. Well, this man has not done that. To me, he is one of the most important human beings I have ever met, and thank God I did. This medical doctor doesn't need any recognition. He doesn't need any money. He is a very busy man, but I tell you what, this man managed him and Mr. Abdul Rahman to take it upon themselves to create or to start an Arabic school for our children. I know that nobody twisted Abdul Rahman's hand or his wife. Nobody grabbed Najah Hashelji by the neck and told him, go do the school. Nobody gave them money. Nobody gave them anything. These two human beings, ladies and gentlemen, took it upon themselves to educate our children. And I don't know of any other human being that can deserve a more welcome and appreciation. Mr. Abdul Rahman, Dr. Najah Hashelji, please come forth. one-fifth of the world population would enjoy peace and tranquility. And thank you very much, very much. Dr. Shelji, Brother Abdurrahman, thank you all very, very much. I wish and I hope from all my heart that Najah Shelji and Abdurrahman and Mahsin Jouini will be examples for the rest of our community. 
I know that a lot of us are willing to help and trying to help. Sometimes it took a lot of arm twisting and wringing even to get people here to this banquet. At $25 a person, we are not making money. We are losing money. But we want everybody to be here, and that is why we kept it that way. And I hope and pray that the rest of the Arab community and every member of us will take it upon themselves to get involved and be active and contribute. We are one. The next award, ladies and gentlemen, will be going to Dr. Don Bob. I want to tell you a little bit about Dr. Don Bob. Dr. Don Bob <clears throat> has been a very active member, not only of ADC, he has owned, he has his own, or he has created his own organization, which he calls the Trilog. The Trilog is an organization that brings Muslims, Christians, and Jews together to air their views, to talk about their differences, and to bridge the gap and build a bridge of understanding for humanity. Dr. Don Bob, the San Antonio chapter of ADC, would like to honor you tonight. You so very well and so very much deserve it. Dr. Don Bob. San Antonio chapter. Uh, I see now what you meant. I had to be here tonight. Huh? Yes. <laughs> On the way down, Khalil said, uh, by the way, you better think about a five minute talk. And I said, what? At <laughs> any rate, um, ever since I was a member of the I witness delegation, I witnessed Israel delegation of the ADC two years ago to Israel and to the West Bank. I have been uh, impassioned by what our speaker so eloquently talked about tonight. In particular, of course, the Palestinian aspect of the Arab community and the cause that we have so neglected in our own Western culture and our own American country. It is often with such emotion that I watch the news or read about it because of my experiences during the Intifada and experiencing it firsthand that I am unable to communicate to my fellow Americans all that I saw, <clears throat> and in which I feel they should know the injustice that we have perpetrated for the past 40 years and continue to perpetrate due to misunderstanding, due to pressures, due to forces that perhaps the American people are not aware of, and how much work we still have to do to still accomplish the ends that Dr. Maksud talked about. It um, sometimes seems like an impossible task. And although I'm a born optimist, there are times when one feels that it does seem hopeless. And yet I'm convinced that things are beginning to break. I can see progress in the last two years in talking to my fellow Americans. That things are beginning to change. That the injustices of the past are beginning to be recognized and that they must be corrected. I just had two workshops up, workshops up in Dallas last night and today on, on Islam. People were, were flooding to the workshop because of the Gulf crisis, all of a sudden realizing that, hey, wait a minute, something's been missing. We haven't been following something. You know, there's been a gap in our education. Yeah, I said, is it a big gap in your history books, too? You didn't know about all the Arab culture, the Arab civilizations of the past centuries that we have so often ignored and pretended did not exist. And so it's an eye-opening experience for a lot of Americans today to begin, if they are willing, to understand what has been missing in our education. And God grant that somehow we can fill in those gaps before it's too late, before we have to go through tragedies and massacres such as are being foreseen by our political leaders. God grant that somehow we plead all of us by letters to our congressmen and senators and and to the State Department and to President Bush for negotiation 
And when Saddam Hussein proposes a negotiation that we not reject it totally and say it's ridiculous, we insist only on all our demands,